As part of this eight part series, so far we've had experts share knowledge around the stages of implementation science, using data to meet your organization's needs and the process for selecting evidence-based practices. If you would like to watch or rewatch any of those recordings, they can be found on our website and we'll post that link here in the chat pretty soon. Today's session is focused on cultural humility. So what it is, ways to encourage it across your organization and how it can support health equity initiatives. The future sessions that we'll have throughout the rest of the year will be focused on trauma and grief informed care, financing, measurement based care and collaboration and we very much hope that you're able to join those as well. So before I introduce our speaker, we do want to let the audience know that today's 55 minute session is being recorded and that it's in webinar format. So while all attendees are muted and can't share their video, we will have a couple moments throughout the webinar where we will pause, have some moments of self reflection and we encourage you to post in the chat, uh, fill in the Q&A box and interact with us. Um, we also want to acknowledge that there may be certain moments throughout this webinar that may cause some level of discomfort, but we're all here to learn and grow and expand the practices that we have to best serve our communities. So we invite you to think about the things that you want to take on personally and professionally. And again, we just want um, lots of interaction, so feel free to uh, post the chat and Q&A. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Marcy Melvin who is the Deputy Director of the Hackett Center for Mental Health at the Meadows Institute. She is a licensed professional counselor in Texas and has over 25 years of experience in providing direct clinical and supervisory services to children, youth, parents, and young adults in clinical settings. She has taken the lead on creating the Meadows Institute strategic framework that incorporates health equity into our policy work, and she supports the implementation of these strategies across the organization. Marcy has a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Xavier University of Louisiana and a Master of Arts in Clinical Psychology from Fisk University. Marcy, we're so happy to have you here and I'll turn the session over to you. Thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate the warm welcome and being invited to engage in this really important conversation with everyone. Um, so today we're gonna talk about cultural humility um, what is it? And then how can we utilize cultural humility to help support health equity? Um, as we begin, I want to just talk a little bit about the Hackett Center. So as the Deputy Director of the Hackett Center, I want to explain that the Hackett Center is the regional arm for Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute in the Houston and Gulf Coast area. Um, and really, we're all about putting policy into practice. So let's jump in and, and talk about what we're going to discuss today. Um, and so as we were putting together this presentation, I kept hearing Patrick's words in my head. So Patrick did the last um, discussion talk last month where he talked about selecting evidence-based practices. And one of the things he mentioned was in the delivery of any effective presentation, you should never start with definitions. And it's like, oh, we're gonna have to start with definitions. We're gonna have to start with kind of framing out and explaining kind of how we're going to approach this conversation. So we are gonna have to start with defining some terms. We're gonna then jump into um, what are some practical strategies that we can utilize in order to practice cultural humility. We're gonna talk about intersectionality. What does that mean and how does that apply to clinical practice. Um, we're gonna talk about just really briefly, um, recap some of the things that Patrick discussed when he was discussing selecting evidence-based practices and kind of look at it from that um, cultural humility lens and how do we select culturally appropriate evidence-based practices. Then we're gonna get into some real practical strategies on how to promote health equity while utilizing cultural humility. Um, and then as we go throughout this conversation, um, please at any point submit questions um, either in the chat or in the Q&A um, and then Jessica will alert me and I'll be more than happy to engage in some of this discussion with you. So let's get started. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we did come across was this great quote that talked about precise and honest communication 
using shared terms and definitions allows for fewer unknowns between the speaker and the listener. So that's gonna be the frame of why we're starting with these definitions. Um, we're gonna start with kind of, we're talking about culture, right? Cultural competence, cultural humility. Well, we thought maybe we needed to take just a slight step back and kind of think about what do we mean when we say culture? Um, so the Office of Minority Health defines culture as the integrated pattern of thoughts, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, uh, and institutions associated either wholly or partly with racial, ethnic, and linguistic groups. Um, it culture encompasses um, religious, spiritual beliefs, um, geographic locations, socioeconomic um, status, um, and sociological characteristics. I think it's really important that as we're talking about and thinking about culture, that we remember that it's dynamic um, and that uh, individuals may identify with a multitude of cultures um, across their lifetime. So that's also something that we want to consider. When we're talking about culture, let's recognize that um, culture is the lens through which we may view the world in, that we encounter through, right? And if we are viewing someone else, there may be certain aspects of them where their culture may be very visible to us, right? Whether it's their age, their gender, um, their, you know, just physical characteristics, the language that they're using, but there are also other parts of their culture that are gonna be less visible, that we may not see right away, right? And so that may be the way that they're interpreting body language. Um, sexual identity, um, how faith plays a role in their life and in their decision-making patterns, um, their educational background, and what did that look like? So there, there are visible as well as less visible things. And so I think it's really important that we recognize that when we're talking about culture, we're talking about all of these dynamic things that really come into play with people. Now, when we're talking about cultural competence, we're talking about the ability to uh, communicate effectively with someone while acknowledging and understanding their culture, right? So it is how do we understand and view their culture and then communicate with them in an effective way in order to get our point across. Um, it, it, you know, when we're talking about cultural competence, we're talking about the awareness of, you know, our view, as well as being open enough to embrace um, other individuals' attitudes and ideas. Um, so cultural competence is, you know, just kind of having the knowledge and awareness in order to effectively communicate with someone else. So if we take it one step further and we talk about cultural humility, cultural humility is a little different because it's cultural humility isn't just about understanding someone else's culture and all the things they're bringing to the table. With cultural humility, we have to recognize our own culture and the lens through which we look at and view other individuals. And so, um, Cultural humility involves a self-reflective component that is not there when we're talking about cultural competence. Um, cultural humility is uh, an ongoing, lifelong process, right? So when we are committing to cultural humility, we are being very intentional and deliberate about making sure we are considering our own personal backgrounds and reflections in how we are looking at and viewing someone else. Um, so we're taking all of those things into consideration. Cultural humility is dynamic within itself um, because we recognize that the more that we learn, the more that we grow, the more that we interact with people, then that lens through which we view people through may shift and change. So we need to remain humble about our knowledge as it relates to the clients that we're serving. Um, and even as we meet 
one individual and we begin to understand the differences and the complexities of the culture that they bring to the table, we need to remember cultural humility will remind us that all we have done is met one person, right? Because when we're thinking about cultural, we know that no group is mon monolithic and that there is this diverse um, categorization that happens. And so it's really important that we kind of take this from the knowledge base of understanding um, you know, how our own values come into play as we're attempting to understand and connect uh, with our clients or with others. And so I love this diagram because it does a beautiful job of laying out kind of these different degrees, right? Um, it helps us to examine just the relationship between privilege, power, um, and cultural humility, right? So cultural humility is much more than just the awareness of someone's culture or the sensitivity to their culture, but it's part of that lifelong commitment, um, that idea of beginning to lean in and learn from clients, right? And it, it's an attempt to understand the power differential. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what do we mean when we're talking about a power differential. And if you are a practitioner um, and you are providing clinical services, clients that enter into your office, there is a very natural power differential that exists. And it's really important that we understand um, that power differential and that we own it. And then if you add complexities of um, race and gender and sex into the equation, then that may further complicate that power differential. Um, but as the clinician who in that setting may hold the most power, the onus and the responsibility is on us uh, to make sure that we are creating this open and safe space for clients to come in to begin to, to talk and unpack what they're needing to unpack. So, you know, as I've given you kind of this framework of what is culture, what is cultural humility, and then how all of these things lay out, I want to um, kind of talk about what does this look like in actual practice? You know, so when we're talking about cultural humility, it's that lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and self-critique. It's having that stance of curiosity, respect, empathy, and understanding that while we may show up and be experts in a lot of things, we are not experts in the lives and experiences of the clients whom we are serving. Um, and in knowing that, we acknowledge that there may be a, a power imbalance. And so we are intentional about um, kind of leveling the playing field in order that the clients that we're serving understand that we respect them as being the experts within their own life and within their own experiences. Um, and in order to do this, you know, we need to make sure that we recognize any judgments that we may have or may bring to the table. Um, we make sure that we show up and we are being genuine and compassionate. Um, and if we are inquisitive, then we are seeking information in an extremely humble and safe manner. Um, so it's not questioning and aggressive uh, or in a manner that may feel threatening to our clients. I mean, so ultimately we're trying to create a safe and welcoming environment and constantly checking the temperature and making sure that the client is comfortable and that they are comfortable with saying that they're uncomfortable with something that we may have said or done. Um, and so I'm hoping that we're able to kind of take in some of these elements of how do we actually practice uh, cultural competence. I'm going to pause for a second and see if we have any thoughts, reflections. Yeah, that's such important uh, material to continually say that this is a lifelong journey, that we're humans, we're bound to make mistakes, and sometimes our intention is different from our impact. So I'm thinking about past experiences when I was a clinician, and there were definitely times when there was an ooch or an ouch, and Things didn't come across the way I had intended, but I always took time to either 
bring it up in the next session if it felt safe and comfortable for that person so that we can have a dialogue about it. And I think sometimes it's really hard when we may not see that client again. And we, that's when the self-reflection, self-evaluation piece is super important. So I'm wondering if we have different people in the audience today who are providers and they're thinking about those times too, like, ooh, that didn't go as intended and how can I be better? Um, so we're gonna launch a quick poll um, on your screen. You should see this list of six different options of practical ways to enhance cultural humility in the practice that you provide or in the organizations for the people that you serve. So if you would like to pick one or two areas on this list that you wanna focus on more, this can be in your relationship with clients or it can be just anybody that you encounter in your life because we're all um, interacting and interchanging and we're bound to make mistakes, but we're going to intentionally practice to be culturally humble. So um, I see some votes still coming in. So I'll pause a minute for this brief moment of silence. I love that we're doing this poll, Jessica, with this self-reflection. And I recognize that, you know, as we're talking, I used the example of um, the power differential that exists between clinicians and their clients. Um, and I want to make sure that I take a step back, that as we're talking about being culturally, um, hum uh, hum you know, we're talking about cultural humility or being culturally humble, we're talking about not just within our offices while we're practicing, but within entire organizations. So everything that we're talking about can apply at every level within an organization from the CEO down. So we're talking about how do we create an entire culture within our organization where our clinicians feel like they are able to, um, you know, that, that there's this cultural humility that exists between them and their supervisors. Um, so I wanna make sure that while we use that specific example um, that happens with our client, that we can expand that beyond. Um, and I love that we have this up there because let me tell you, as a clinician, I remember starting off having lots of oops moments. And I was very thankful to have um, a clinical supervisor who was able to help me work through that. And then when I became a new supervisor and I had a huge staff I was managing, I had lots of oopses there as well, right? Because that is another layer of a power differential. So really being able to take the time to pause and to reflect and to create an open platform where people feel as though they can come and, and let you know when you have created an ouch. I think that's super important because we can all learn from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thank you all for participating in this poll. We're not going to share the results just so that it, this is a time to think like, of course, I'd like to do all six, but here are the ones that I'm intentionally actively choosing to commit to today. Um, so I will end this, this poll and then turn it over back to you, Marcy. Thank you. Thank you. So we're, when we're talking about the need to strive for cultural humility, there's another component that actually comes into play, which is intersectionality. And I, I sort of alluded to this when I was talking about all of the different ways um, of definitions and just how dynamic culture is, right? So when we're talking about intersectionality, we're talking about this framework of understanding how all of these different dynamic characteristics of an individual may come into play. Um, and it helps us to understand that when there are so many different dynamic characteristics, it also um, contributes or opens the door for there to be a lot of um, unique discrimination as it relates to all of the various intersections. So we're talking about race and gender um, and socioeconomic background and nationality and um, gender identity, right? And so when we are looking at an individual and their culture, it's really important that we understand all of the components that comes into play. Um, and yeah, that can be, that may be easier for some of us than others, but it's really important for that to be a part of the conversation. And when we are recognized as we look at and engage with our clients or when we look at and engage our staff, 
recognizing the lens that we're utilizing and knowing that we may need to add a lens of intersectionality to be able to fully understand all of the issues that may be coming to the table or for our staff, all of the complexities that they may be managing on a day-to-day just because they are human, um, right? So they may be a woman, a person of color, um, and of a, a, a you know first generation um, immigrant, right? All of those intersections are things that you know they don't take one of them off. It's not a cloak. It's all of these who make them who they are. So being able to create a space to recognize all of that is critical and important. It's critical and important whether we're in a therapy session and it's critical and important whether we're in a staff meeting, right? So making sure that we understand all of these complexities. You know, Jessica, when we were talking about putting this to, this training together, it, you know, intersectionality was one that quickly came up. We were able to identify the need to discuss intersectionality and how this interplays in our relationships, how this interplays in the therapeutic session, how this may interplay within the overall climate of an organization. Um, and then something else that I thought was really important for us to talk about was um, colorblindness, right? And so while we, I just gave you the importance of understanding intersectionality, and I, I wanna own the fact that, you know, at one point, <laughs> I mean, cause I remember hearing practitioners when I very early on started off, who, you know, were attempting to approach things from this place of being colorblind, right? And so, um, you know, I want, I'm going to acknowledge, and we're going to talk about it in another side that that race is a, a social and an economic construct. Um, you know, let's own the fact that it is something that people cannot change. We cannot change the color of our skin or our racial identity, um, and so it is something that people see. It is something that we live with on a day to day basis. And so this whole concept though of being colorblind or, you know, it, when I work with my clients, I don't see color, uh, white, black, everything is the same. Well, the problem is when race related problems arise, colorblindness tends to individualize conflicts and shortcomings rather than examining the larger picture with cultural differences. So a colorblind approach um, kind of allows us to deny uncomfortable cultural differences. An example that I have of this is um, I had the charge of working with a group of clinicians in order to help increase the access and effectiveness at which they were working with um, a community of color. And so in kind of going through this process, we would do, you know, case consultations, clinical case consultations. And there was one case that stands out in my head um, of a practitioner who really attempted to practice colorblindness because, you know, she felt like she was really um, kind of opening and creating an opening and welcoming space. Well, in one instance, she was actually providing therapeutic services um, to a, a Black student athlete. Um, and so one of the issues that this student had was um, he was having difficulty on campus, feeling as though um, he was constantly being harassed by campus security, um, feeling as though he couldn't walk into the cafeteria or into the bookstore without someone constantly following behind him and just generally in public spaces on campus, feeling as though he was being singled out and questioned about his right to be in that space. So as she's presenting the case um, and she's looking at this through this colorblind lens, one of the things that she brought for the case consultation was the consideration that this individual was suffering from some psychosis um, because he seemed to have this heightened um, sense of paranoia. And so, you know, I'm, I'm sitting and I'm listening. And at one point I had to stop her because it's like, well, let's consider those things are real. What if those things are really happening on this campus? And just 
so that everyone who's listening to me knows those things were very real. Um, those things happened frequently on that campus. So, um, and that was not something that she had considered. And so, you know, because she was really trying to be colorblind. So in that situation, right, even though she was attempting to create this open and welcoming space, her attempt to being colorblind, she wasn't looking at all of the, this individual um, in their full light. She wasn't considering all of the, the, the factors that contributed to who they were as a person. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that that's part of the conversation. So, you know, we need to, to not shy away from talking about race. Um, it's like one of those things that it's real. And if you are a, a clinician or a supervisor and you're like, oh, I don't know if I can talk about race with, um, you know, a person of color who you may be working with. At the end of the day, they know that they're a person of color and they've already recognized that there are differences. So let's create a very open and safe space to be able to have a conversation. And, you know, I, I wanna circle back because yes, race is a social construct um, that was invented as a way to classify um, humans in a way to justify, you know, a lot of decisions that were made in the past. Right. And so I, I want to frame it out that race, it's not real. Race is a social construct and it really isn't a real thing. But racism is and the impact of racism um, is a real thing. Um, so just making sure that, you know, I, I want it to be very clear as we're trying to to lay out this conversation. So now I want to, you know, again, try to give as many practical applications as possible. Right, so how do we apply intersectionality into our practice? Um, and it goes back to when we're thinking through that lens of cultural humility. Um, you know, and while I'm going through uh, this kind of the next couple of slides, I, you know, I see just just posted, you know, a reflection uh, question uh, for you to kind of look at and think through. So it's important for us to recognize that, you know, individuals whom we, we, we may be working with or whom we may be serving, um, they may be experiencing or identifying multiple forms of discrimination um, on a day to day basis. And so and these different levels of discrimination um, may impact either how they utilize services or how they access services. So one, it's important for us to recognize that that exists. Um, another thing, allowing them to have a voice. Okay, we talked about before is that one of like we may be experts in lots of different things, but we are not experts in the lived experience of someone else. So making sure that we are creating space for our clients, for our colleagues for our staff members um, to be able to have a voice um, and a voice in which um, they're able to, you know, express their opinions and we're able to listen and inquire and it, not inquire from the lens of challenging, but inquiring from the lens of really trying to understand. Um, needing to understand and acknowledge the role that family may play. And when we're talking about intersectional identities, then we need to, to recognize that the roles that family may play and how families are defined may be very different. Um, and I think this is really important, especially if we're thinking through gender and sexual um, I, you know, identity gender and sexual um, expression, right? So the roles that family may play um, in those individuals' lives or how they define family may be differently. So understanding that and creating a space to be able to allow your client to express their unique perspective. Um, when we're talking about intersectionality in practice, you know, of course, everything we do is data-driven. Um, but it's also important for us to recognize that we need to not just look at the data as a whole, but we need to be able to disaggregate the data 
in order to look at unique individuals' experience. So looking at all of the various target groups of the data that we have collected to see how they may relate to the overall data. Only by doing that will we be able to identify any disparities or disproportionalities that may exist in the work that we are currently doing. Um, next, um, again, being open to the fact that our clients or our coworkers may think differently or have different experiences as it relates to social justice issues and how things that are happening in the world may be directly impacting their lives. Um, and then understanding how discrimination and inequality has, can have a direct negative impact on our health, right? So our access to healthcare or food or water or fresh air and understanding um, the, the interrelation between those two. And so I know that Jessica had posted um, some self-reflection um, for you guys to consider. Jess? Yeah, so if people feel comfortable, feel free to share anything with us in the chat that may be coming up for you. I think for me, as you were talking about respecting the voice of clients, really having them be part of the, the path that you guys are taking, whether that's, you know, in our work, it's creating assessments or building learning collaboratives to provide the best care to communities um, in the different areas throughout Texas. So I am already thinking about like, what does this look like in practice? I'm curious if other people would want to share too in the chat how, how they might be applying this and what their takeaways are. But I would also love to pick your brain, Marcy, to see what's coming up for you, like maybe concrete examples that people might be able to learn about that they can then incorporate, whether that's like um, building more things into their team meetings, um, changing the way they approach something, what's kind of coming up that you feel like would be really awesome to share with the audience? You know, one of the things that I think about um, when I think about intersectionality um, and really being able to, to view an individual and all of the complexities that they may be faced with um, is the conversation that I have had with multiple clinics about no-show rates, right? Mm -hmm. And so I know you may be thinking, what's the correlation between no-show rates and intersectionality? Um, oftentimes, I cannot tell you the number of clinicians that I've sat down with that talk about you know, their clients and how they just don't value treatment, right? Because if they value treatment, then they would actually show up for the session. Um, and so, and it's like, okay, again, that is not a very cultural, humble approach. Um, and it's not taking all of the pieces into consideration. So I'm reminded of a story of a, um, she's an adult now, but as an adolescent, this adolescent who was seeking treatment on her own, right? So she was old enough to consent for her own um, mental health treatment. And because she had come from a family of abuse and a lot of other issues, um, she, you know, saw recognized early on the value of engaging in the therapeutic process. Um, well, as a result of the, the family origin that she grew up in, she ended up having to move a lot. So she, you know, ended up being in, would often be in different um, homeless shelters um, with one of her parents. And so, you know, she maybe moved across town from where her, where she was receiving services. And so she talked about how there were times if she had to take, you know, several buses to try and get to that clinic, or it wasn't several buses because she didn't have bus fare. So instead she decided to walk. Um, and it took her almost three hours to walk to the clinic to get to the appointment to be, you know, kind of greeted by her clinician and, you know, questioned on whether she valued um, her, you know, her clinician's time because she was either late for the session or she had missed the previous session, completely missed the point because, you know, what this young lady was saying is, oh no, I absolutely value this. This is why I walked three hours to get here. Or yes, I value this, which is why I spent half a day to get here. I just, you know, I couldn't get the bus schedules to work to get here earlier. So I think it's really important that, you know, before we start applying 
our lens um, to things that we really try to understand that client perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I thank you for sharing that, that example. And I think too, um, the word trust kind of popped up a lot throughout your um, story too, where it's like, how can we build environments that create more trust and have that sort of voice come through and just people being able to share their true authentic experience so that we can best support them in their goals and collaborate together. Um, and I see in the, the Q&A box, we have a couple um, things in there. So one person said, changing language in staff meetings so that during meetings, not just doctors or managers have a voice, but each level of service providers are included. Absolutely. Yeah. And go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm looking at Stella's uh, questions <laughs> as well. And I'm just like, yes, Stella, you showed up today. Thank you. Um, welcome to the conversation. Um, and so Stella, what you pointed out was understanding and recognizing our power, right? And if you are an individual who holds power, then recognizing that when you are in a staff meeting and paying attention when there are staff that you may not have heard from and creating a space for them to be able to voice their thoughts or their opinions, right? And if they choose not to share, creating a space for them to be able to decline. Right. But making that and normalizing that as a way in which we operate, that's extremely important. And, um, you know, Stella, you're talking about the way we talk about weight and to eliminate this whole fat shaming that is done throughout our society. Right. One way that we can do that is by acknowledging that that is something that happens across the board. Right. Once we acknowledge it and we can identify it, then we can begin to change and shift that conversation. Um, so, you know, I appreciate, you know, all of the things that you are bringing up. Um, and then one other comment you're adding is that um, another way to try and bridge the difference is that some people are not tech savvy and they are often shamed and ridiculed. Absolutely. Um, anyone who knows me, you would have heard me say this a thousand times and you're gonna hear me say this a thousand more times. Language matters. The words that we use are powerful and they matter. And we need to be very careful in the language that we are utilizing, especially when we are talking about the clients and individuals that we're serving. And so this whole concept of shaming or blaming um, anyone or, or, or making, you know, uh, using words that result in someone feeling different or isolated, it does the exact opposite of what we are intending to do. Um, and it's not helpful in moving us forward in our overall goals. So I love that you, um, I love some of the things that you brought up. Yes, thank you for sharing, Stella. And um, I, I'm just nodding along as you're talking because I'm thinking about the word intersectionality and I'm thinking about inclusivity and how what Stella brought up today is talking about just acknowledging where people are, maybe what has been standing in their way to get them where they need to be today or they were, where they want to be, and how we just need to acknowledge that, you know, the, the, term, the term of equity, that not everybody's on the level playing field and how can we kind of support people where they are today so that we can be most useful um, and most inclusive. So I, love that. I know and, you're gonna get into that later I know. too. So. <laughs> Slow down, Jess. Before we get there, we're gonna go through and just talk about um, culturally appropriate uh, evidence-based practices. And actually we're gonna be leaning heavily on part of the conversation that you, know, you tuned into when Dr. Patrick Tennant gave his talk. Um, and so there was just a couple of things that he mentioned that I wanna highlight, especially if we're thinking about this through this lens of cultural humility, um, right? And so just three things that I have for us to consider. And it's like, you know, the scope, what is the actual intended scope of the evidence-based practice that you're selecting? Um, how are you tracking the implementation and impact of the evidence-based practice? And then how are you monitoring it? Are we monitoring it for fidelity? What are the quality improvement techniques or methods that are involved? Um, and I'm gonna you know, go through this somewhat quickly, but you know, during the previous speaker series, um, you know, Patrick talked about ways that we can be more intentional 
and impactful when selecting evidence-based practices. You know, and this is largely because racial and ethnic disparities in the United States existed along the entire continuum of mental health care, from access and use of services to the quality and outcome of care. I mean, so there needs to be efforts to address these inequalities, especially in mental health care. Um, and so, you know, we're focusing on adapting evidence-based treatments that are gonna be more responsive to the needs and uh, preferences of more diverse populations. And so, you know, here's just some questions that I think it's really important for us to consider when we are selecting that um, evidence-based practice, right? I mean, because it's not just about um, who is the intervention designed for, but what is it that we want the intervention to do? Um, one of the, you know, things we commonly say is, you know, when you have a hammer, everything is a nail. Um, and so what we're wanting is to just not make sure that we are just applying the same evidence-based practice to everyone and then expecting the same outcome. So really taking the time to go through these questions and consider them when selecting the intervention that you are wanting to utilize. So once you've selected that evidence-based intervention, then you wanna consider the implementation piece, right? And it's okay, what are gonna be the measurements that you're gonna to use to determine if the intervention is working? We need to make sure that we are going to be monitoring and collecting this. And you know, if the data comes back and says that the intervention that you've been implementing isn't working, then what are you gonna do? What's gonna be your next step? And so I think it's important to kind of think through these and create a plan prior to the implementation of these strategies. Um, otherwise, we end up in situations where we are you know, providing an intervention and perhaps there is no improvement on the client's part. Um, and instead of us as clinicians looking at the intervention and questioning, is this the right treatment for this client? We then begin to question the, the client, right? Because they're not, um, taking treatment seriously. Um, they're not really doing the work. And as I, I'm saying this, I, I'm being completely honest because very early on, I was in clinical supervisions where I had individuals that this is the conversations that were taking place. And so I need to make sure that we are changing the discussion. We're changing this, the discussion in the room with the clients, we're changing the discussion in the room with our clinical supervisees, and we're changing the discussion when we're meeting with upper management. And then next, we need to be thinking about that fidelity piece, right? So, you know, their cultural adaptation focuses on modifying elements of evidence-based treatments without compromising its effectiveness in order to enhance the fit between treatment um, the clients and the provider's culture, values, preferences, and norms, right? So you're looking at trying to align all of those things. Um, but it's really important that we are looking at and that there is the data available for us to be able to truly evaluate, are we implementing this to fidelity to ensure that um, so we're going to question ourselves before we begin to question the client, um, because we may need to change the intervention in order that we have a better intervention that meets the need of that client. Jessica? Yes. Um, um, thanks. I'm going to share a resource that Marcy had referenced from our last uh, speaker series session. It's in the chat for the Pew database. And exactly what Marcy's saying. So when working with people, it's not a one size fits all process. So we can't expect EVPs to be one size fits all ready to go. So we also want to encourage people to reach out to the developers of the evidence-based practice in particular, to be able to work with that adaptation process to really make sure it can best fit that particular client's needs and the people that you serve. Um, so I know with the last section of this webinar, it's really hitting home with uh, ways to promote health equity across your practice and your organization. So I'll leave you to take, it, take us away in that way. Awesome, and as we continue, again, if you have thoughts, questions, comments, please either throw them in the chat um, or throw them in the Q&A. Um, I love this interaction. 
Otherwise, I feel like I'm sitting in my home talking to myself and occasionally Jessica. And otherwise, I love to kind of interact with folks. Um, so now we're going to switch gears and kind of bring this full circle um, and talking about health equity and how everything that we've talked about can help us to advance health equity. And before we did that, I think we need to kind of, again, operationalize what is health equity in order that we can level the playing field for the conversation, right? And so, I mean, essentially health equity means that everyone, it means ensuring that everyone has a chance to be as healthy as possible, right? So we want to ensure that they can be as healthy as possible. Um, and I'm sure we have seen a multitude of different graphics that have illustrated um, what we mean by equity. And um, I actually like this, I think better than a lot of the others um, because it represents the fact that we cannot take a one size fits all approach, right? And we can have a finish line that we want to move everyone through. We want to get everyone to that point to be as healthy as possible. And then it recognizes that everyone is going to need something a little bit differently to help them to accomplish that goal. And so while we are, you know, striving towards health equity, we know that it's going to require three different things. We're going to have to address underlying social inequities. I mean, they exist. So we're going to have to name it in order to be able to do something about it. Um, we're going to have to embrace targeted interventions. Um, and we're going to have to make sure that the measurements that we're utilizing are all equitable in nature. So when we're talking about social inequities, um, we are talking about, um, you know, how do we demonstrate, we have to demonstrate and embrace cultural humility within the work that we're doing. Cultural humility gives us a greater understanding of cultures that are different from our own and helps us to recognize each person's unique cultural experience. Um, it helps to create this framework um, where we can assume that individuals from groups different from our own have the wisdom and the ability to teach and learn to problem solve and to innovate. Cultural humility is really making sure that we are putting kind of our clients or individuals we're working with in a driver's seat. They are the expert in their lives. So we need to kind of engage with them in order that we can learn from them to kind of help promote this. Next, it's targeted interventions. So having um, targeted interventions which um, undermine active or passive forces of structural exclusion and marginalization. Um, when we're doing targeted, universe, targeted interventions, we recognize that not all of our clients are the same or not all of our staff are the same. And that every time someone shows up in a room, they're gonna show up and they may have differing needs. I go back to, we may have this overarching goal, right? For everyone that we may work with to be as healthy as possible. And if that is our universal goal, when we're doing targeted interventions, we recognize that everybody's not starting from the same place. So if our goal is for everyone to be as mentally healthy as possible, but everyone is not starting from the same place, well, then we can't apply the same strategies across the board. And instead, we need to have some type of a universal screening so that we understand what are the various needs and then have mechanisms in place to be able to have those, help those individuals or help those clients that may have limited resources and really complex needs because they're gonna have a greater gap between that, um, that universal goal of you know, helping everyone to be as healthy as possible in their starting place. So recognizing that we're not gonna be able to apply the same method to everyone. And then making sure that we are using um, an equitable me measurement. And so when we're talking about measuring equity, um, right, we're looking at those initial screenings. 
uh, we're looking at making sure that we are encouraging and getting our clients' experiences and their perspective um, in on the conversation, right? How do we engage uh, with communities and utilize and leverage their knowledge to help us in the decision-making process, right? So it's about creating these communities of dialogue where we are embracing and encouraging individuals that we are working with um, to partner with us through this process. And so, you know, again, like when we're thinking through what are practical strategies that will help us all to be able to promote health equity, um, well, making sure that we have a diverse workforce making sure that our workforce is representative of the community that we are serving. Um, and when I say making sure that that workforce is representative, it's at every layer of that workforce, right? So we, it's not just about representation, but it's also about having the ability to voice and express thoughts and opinions that may be different from others, right? So defer, fully diversifying workforces, um, making sure that there are um, interpreter services available. And, and when I say interpreter services, I mean the preferred language in which the clients are speaking, making sure that they have an opportunity to engage in dialogue, um, receiving of treatment, or having any type of written communication to be received in their preferred language of communication. Um, and we all have a preferred language of communication. Again, understanding kind of the intersection of socioeconomic backgrounds in everything that we're talking about. And how do those socioeconomic conditions impact the communities in which you are serving? Um, to, to think that you can focus on helping someone with their mental health issues, but not considering all of the socioeconomic factors that may complicate and play into their mental health issues, then again, we're gonna be utilizing a hammer um, for you know, a stapler and it just won't work. Um, so finally, making sure that we are engaging in meaningful and disaggregated data, right? So if we are working with communities, we can, have an understanding of what is the data say for that community, but then also taking a step back to see what is the targeted groups that make up that community, how do their data differ from the universal data that we looked at. Utilizing that disaggregated data to help us to understand what are the inequities of care that currently exist. Um, and then you'll be able to utilize that disag disaggregated data to help come up with targeted plans for those various targeted groups um, in order to help them to advance. Um, and then again, making sure there's ongoing conversations to identify unconscious biases um, that staff may have. Um, at every level, um, as well as having tools to help us manage some of those biases. So I feel like I have given a lot of information in a very short amount of time, and I was really worried I was going to go over, but it looks like I'm really close on time. Um, Jessica. Yeah, I posted a reflection question to the audience as kind of thinking through their takeaway. So um, one major takeaway that I gained from this session, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom, Marcy, is that we're all evolving and shifting and changing and trying to do the best services that we can for the people that we're, we're tasked to support and we're lucky to support. So I think encouraging cultural humility and just humility in general is about building environments for people to feel safe about sharing those moments um, where they made mistakes and correcting them and supporting them in their growth. And I think it's also part of like the self-evaluation piece that we can't expect people to tell us when there's that moment that mm -hmm. caused a disconnect, but it's on us to think through that repair and to keep doing better to prevent um, harm from happening as much as possible. So I think just learning from you today and hearing about all your practical strategies has been immensely helpful. And I know that uh, some people are already asking for the PowerPoint. So um, these strategies are really great. And I think they're all ways to help support our, our organizations achieve more helpful 
help equitable outcomes. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for the time today. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I want to make sure I go back and, and say this again. You know, we, we talked about implementing this with our clients in our office and in our actual practice. And I want to make sure that there's this understanding that we need to kind of broaden that conversation because it isn't just about our clients and our practice, but it's making sure that we have the the organizational structure and the organizational culture that we are working in creates a space where we're all doing this at multiple levels of the organization. Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about the need for embracing and utilizing cultural humility, yes, we want to utilize cultural humility with our clients. We also want to use cultural humility when we interact and engage with one another, um, especially um, recognizing the power differential that we may have um, at different levels within our organization. And so it's not like anyone is immune from this. This applies to all of us. Yes, I'm, I'm picturing the different levels too. And I think I can easily get into my little silo and it's it's beautiful to think of it, like we can all play a, a part in this bigger initiative. So thank you again so much, Marcy. And thank you all who joined us today. We hope you find this series engaging, meaningful, and applicable to the work that you do in your community. And our next uh, session will be on August 18th with Dr. Julie Kaplow, who will share insights on trauma and grief-informed care and best practices to support the people that you're working with. So thank you so much for joining us today and take care.